Austin, Texas. It's the Cube covering OpenStack Summit 2016. Brought to you by the OpenStack Foundation and headline sponsors Red Hat and Cisco. Now here are your hosts, Stu Miniman and Brian Gracely. Welcome back to the Cube. I'm Stu Miniman here with Brian Gracely. We're in day two of three of our live broadcast here uh, from the OpenStack Summit in Austin, Texas. Back to Austin where it all began. Uh, really happy to have back in the program Jonathan Bryce and Mark Collier, both with the OpenStack Foundation. Gentlemen, uh, Jonathan, you did the keynote yesterday. Mark, you did the keynote today. Thanks so much for joining us and thank you to the foundation for helping to bring the Cube here. We, we've been, we love this community. Yeah, it's you know, you always a lot of fun, you know, awesome. good conference. So it's good thank to have you. you guys here. Uh, producing live content during our event. We appreciate it, thank you. Yeah, yeah and you know, we, we very, you know, uh, we, we call this part of our open source tour. You know, yeah. everything that we produce, there's no firewall to log in, our content's Creative Commons, so, you know, take it, use it, do cool things with it. We're, we're amazed at what the community can do when you put stuff out we there, just like Commons. OpenStack. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd become an open licensing geek in my life, but somehow <laughs> I've accidentally learned about a lot of licensing things, but yeah. Creative Commons is a cool thing. All yeah. right, so, 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 so Mark, let, let's start with you. You just had the, had the keynote this morning, a lot of cool things going on. Uh, any, any kind of key takeaways you want to you know, share with the audience? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, one of the things that sort of happened through the, the maturity of, of any project and OpenStack as well is that in the beginning, your head's down, you're just like, how do we make it work? You know, what is it going to solve for? Compute storage networking is a pretty specific set of things, but it was, it was a lot of hard work, you know, networking was really hard, and we got Neutron to a good place in the last year or so, and now you're starting to realize, okay, well, how are people actually using it? Well, we know they're using it with other technologies. We kind of always designed it so you can plug in, you know, storage drivers and, and networking drivers, and so it's kind of designed to be pluggable, but thinking about an even broader context, like what does this kind of LAMP stack look like in the cloud era, and, you know, it's always about the users, right? What are they, they'll, they'll, they'll tell us how they're using it, right? They don't have, you know, really care, you know, where the different components come from. If you can mix different things together as a recipe and make something more valuable and solve a problem, that's what you're going to do. So it happened with LAMP stack, now we're seeing it happen in cloud, and a lot of it, of course, is about containers. But what I was excited about today is we went beyond just like, okay, we're going to talk about Docker or containers or something that's buzzwords, and we're actually going to see demos, we're going to see what it could do for you, like, I think a lot of people were really excited about the, the demo of, uh, that Alex Polby did, you know, because he showed you, know, you can do live upgrades and the sort of healing and the thinking about OpenStack as an application, it's kind of frees your mind a little bit to think about, okay, well there's tools for managing applications. Managing OpenStack is a thing everyone is trying to do better all the time if they're running it. Oh, look, Kubernetes is an application management tool. What if we actually used it in that way? And the fact they were able to do that in just a few weeks of kind of to knock out a prototype, and now they're, they're, they're here working with the, the Cola community, which is one of the open source, open sec projects uh, related to containers. It's just an awesome week to see people turn something that's kind of an idea or just a buzzword into something that could be really useful pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it feels like an interesting week. I mean, it, I was at the second one, you guys were obviously at the first one. You know, back then it was people literally sitting on the floor kind of writing code as we went. Now it's much, much bigger, bigger thoughts. You've got customers talking about how it's changing their business. Uh, but it feels like this week, you know, you guys, you, you made sort of a, a, a concerted effort to say, hey, um, you know, OpenStack has a place and then it, it has a place in, you know, by itself and then it has a place working with a lot of these other projects. It has a, you know, is that the next big step in, in where you're, you know, you're sort of driving the open source, you know, the OpenStack community? It's, you know, you're going to do what you do really well, uh, but we also have to partner, we have to collaborate really well. Is that a theme you think we'll see continuing going forward? Absolutely. The, uh, the job that we have at the foundation, we're a pretty small team inside of this massive community. And the main job this is ten percent of the team. <laughs> it is literally. We have just a little, just over twenty people at the OpenStack Foundation, and uh, fifty thousand you know community members. And so our our number one job is is really um, we think kind of making connections and facilitating discussion and communication and and knowledge sharing across all of that community. And so you know the the topics that we talk about. Um, of course, Mark and I are are incredibly brilliant. <laughs> no, the, the topics that we talk about are not just and humble. things. <laughs> and humble, yeah. They're not just things that, that, that we sit down and we're like, you know, what is the vision that we want to lay out for OpenStack? Almost everything that, that we put out there over the last couple of days has come from uh, real world use cases and the feedback that we're getting from users. And we have users that are at, at really early stages of looking at OpenStack that are, you know, 
kind of in their first production deployment that have started to lay it out across their entire enterprise and others that are really pushing the boundaries of, of what's possible. And, uh, and I think that, that it's a huge benefit that we have in our role where we get to hear from all of them. And then you know, we kind of have to decide what do we think are the important directions within the industry and what do we think are the trends within OpenStack that everybody should be aware of. And, and yeah, I think working with other communities is a big one. I also think that, uh, that you know, I talked about diversity yesterday across industries and across the world. If you look at the users that we had speak, we had um, you know, users and developers from Europe, from North America, from Asia. We had them doing bare metal workloads, virtualization, containers. Uh, cloud native frameworks, it's incredible to see all of these use cases. And so our, our number one job, I think, is really sort of highlight that so that everybody understands what's possible and, and you know, where, where the leading edge is, is kind of pointing. Yeah, so you know, the last couple of years we've been talking kind of about the maturity. There was last year a big discussion about kind of the big tent and, and what was core. Um, you know, we're still releasing every six months, you mm -hmm. know, that, that, that drumbeat. Uh, I'm curious as kind of maturity goes up and you know the number of projects has sprawled. You know, how, how do you look at managing that? Uh, be, you know, are, are there some projects where you know every six months it's it's kind of minor stuff, and and some that we have more rapid development. But you know, any changes in just kind of the general thought of how we should think about the release cycle, people yeah. managing those upgrades, and uh, you know that that that. that I think, yeah, there's, there's a couple of thoughts on that. First of all, just upgrades in general have come so far, and it's, it's always been a pain point, and there's been you know, steady progress, but we're finally getting to the point where you know, upgrades are really realistic for teams in a, in a reasonable time frame, if, if that's what they want to do. But in terms of you know, each individual project, there's very active development every six months, and I don't see that changing in terms of the six-month cycle. But, but to your point, or, or question, I guess, some of the work might be in the area of, of stabilization, usability, uh, reliability, which maybe don't show up as kind of checkbox features. Um, so in that sense, it might seem like, okay, well this particular project, they don't have 100 new features this cycle. Is it slowing down? It's really, you know, it's, a, it's active development, but it's driven very much by users. You know, people have been running OpenStack at scale for two or three years now. They know exactly what they wanted to see, you know, in Liberty and Mataka, and now going forward to Newton and Otaka. I believe is the next Okata. one. Okada. Okada, let's get that wrong. Yeah, it's, it's if only I worked at the foundation, I, I've noticed. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. I'm, so I'm working on sharing that information. <laughs> <laughs> Getting it over here, yeah. So anyway, we're, uh, we're just, we're seeing, it is true that uh, there's more of a focus on you know, scalability and reliability because those are things that, uh, you know, just really, you, could, you get the luxury of focusing on once you've really hit the, the baseline in terms of compute storage and networking. And you know, we talk about being an integration engine. Well, that's about identifying the points of integration, those API contracts, if you will, with, with all these different pieces of the stack. So now we get the luxury of kind of fine tuning the, the user experience piece. Yeah, yeah. I, I, just one other point, you know, uh, the release cycle is something that always gets discussed and, and the community does review, um, you know, is six months the right time or should we do feature based? But I, I think that, uh, you know, if you, if you look at, uh, over a course of time in software, there's going to be some chunk of work that gets done. And the release cycle is really about how much of that do you want to have to consume at once. And you know, for within OpenStack, the community, which includes users that participate in these discussions, has continued to have a preference for having smaller chunks of change to consume at a time versus waiting two years and having a massive um, you know, set of change that, uh, that is, is honestly a lot harder, harder to manage. You know, I, I, um, at the same time, we've seen a lot of maturity in the commercial ecosystem to provide support for long-term um, in-place uh, deployments of OpenStack. But so I, I think you know, it, it always gets discussed. But right now, I think we're going to kind of continue on that on that track. Yeah. Uh, yesterday during during your keynote, uh, AT and T was on stage, uh, and they were talking about not only you know what they do with with OpenStack, but you know, we, we have other parts of challenges to deal with, and they were talking about, we've, we've developed this software, we've developed this software. Do you guys ever sort of step back and go, you know, we, regardless of what OpenStack does, we, we were able to get non-open source companies, you know, HP and Cisco and EMC to write code. You've got companies like AT&T that were always very close. Like, this, this created this movement that, that made these huge entities, uh, as well as the community, become part of that. Did you ever think about that and go, how in the world did we make that yeah. happen? It's probably the single biggest thing that is just amazing about the way the world's moving now. Like, no company, no matter how big they are, really feels anymore they can just dictate, you know, technology direction. 
It used to be the Microsofts of the world and the IT world, you know, just looking at the consumption side, you know, whether it's AT&T or Walmart or whatever. You know, they want to be a part of a community, and that is, that is a huge sea change. And, and I think it's, it's not just them, but it's, it's indicative that if a company that big realizes this is the best way to do it collaboratively, then there's no excuse for any other company to do it. Right. Uh, it, that way. Yeah, and, and it's, it's interesting that you recognize that. You know, back at Rackspace, Mark and I were both at Rackspace when, when we launched OpenStack. Mark was really the guy at Rackspace that, that kind of pushed this concept of, of OpenStack and that we should do this, and he started doing that. You know, we're here in Austin where it all started, and you think back to, uh, to early 2010 when you were going around pitching different people inside of Rackspace. Back then, you know, it was not a, not a hugely popular idea within certain circles of, of Rackspace to start with. But you know, he, he kind of laid out, it was very, he had a lot of foresight to see what was going to happen in, in software in general. And Am I blushing? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but he laid out, you know, basically like, this is the way that the industry is going to go and this is how companies like Rackspace and others can have a much bigger impact. Um, but I think even, yeah, you know, if you look at, at what that has really led to with uh, even things like, like, if you look at most of these projects that are out there now, Apache 2 license. You go back to 2009, 2010, that was not necessarily the, right. the automatic license of choice for new projects. Yeah, I actually think the Apache 2 being the default yeah. is, is, is one of the sort of un, unreported, undiscovered uh, things that, you know, I think OpenStack has, has some, some part in to take some credit for that, that kind of trend. And it's just, it's very uh, business friendly. It, it's, you know, the old sort of uh, dichotomy that people had of like open source is bad, for, is anti-business or it's all yeah. just, you know, socialism or whatever. You know, people realize, okay, that's not really the real world. The real world is open source and business go well together really well. I mean, there would be no Facebook without open source. There would be no yeah. Twitter without open source. Like, these are businesses. Open source made them possible. And so Apache is a, a really nice license. Again, I'm getting, I don't know how I became a license <laughs> nut, but it was I'm a big fan. Was, yeah, but oh. I mean, it, it lays a framework for, for uh, collaboration between competitors. And, and that has been something that, in a lot of industries, has been done through standards bodies. And because we're seeing this kind of shift and this comfort with, like you said, these companies that they might go work on a networking storage protocol standard or AT&T works with other telcos on a mobile radio standard. Yep. But now we're actually seeing them do that in the open <laughs> with code rather than standards bodies for months and months. And I think that's really, really interesting and really important. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit on the business side of things. So mm -hmm. you know, everybody always looks at, you know, how do I make you know, money off open source? Uh, you know, you take the Linux example. We said, you know, Red Hat's done quite well, but you know, we wouldn't have Google if it wasn't for Linux. I mean, Linux is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. So, you know, so many things run, it's an integral part of what we're doing here at OpenStack. Uh, one of the analyst firms put out and they said, you know, we're in a neighborhood of you know, between a billion and two billion dollars worth of you know, revenue associated with it. Um, are we looking at this right? You know, I wonder, will OpenStack be like Linux, that pieces of it become ubiquitous, uh, and therefore it drives solutions that I won't think of as OpenStack? Um, or, and how much is you know, OpenStack you know, revenue? Well, before we answer that, I just wanted to, to throw out a shout out for Jason Seats, who, who was actually very instrumental at Rackspace, yeah. in, in, in planting the seed in a lot of people's minds that, that open source was a good way to go. But, I just wanted to give, give him a shout out, because he's, he's moved on and, he, and he's now uh, uh, investing with Techstars, so he, he's doing all kinds of other stuff now, but if you ever get a chance to interview Jason C. Yeah, that's, now you answer this other question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the, it's, it is really interesting. When you, when you sort of change completely how the technology gets developed, I think that you ultimately will change how the technology gets um, operated and consumed, and uh, and and there's often a lag. I think you know it, when you you mentioned Linux, for instance, when when Linux came out, the the world of operating system software was was commercial. You bought a license from a company, you worked with that company. When Linux started, what you saw was a lot of companies that tried to sell you Linux software. <laughs> you know, they yeah. tried to sell you a Linux operating system because that's what they what had been done with Unix and and OS2 and Windows and everything. And, uh, and eventually people realized that, that really, you know, Linux is an enabling technology for higher level services and you have to figure out how to run it, how to operate it, most importantly, how to take it and build something else with it. In the early days of OpenStack, we, we saw a number of companies that had a similar model, which is we're going to take 
code from, from upstream and give it to you and you know, try to find a way to charge around that, you know, that specific process. That ended up not being an incredibly successful business model. And, uh, and what you see now are people who are adding value around the upstream code. Either they run it as a service, they run it you know, hosted private cloud, public cloud, they provide services for integration with all of the other systems like you were talking about earlier mm -hmm. that you need to tie into if you're an AT&T or, or an SAP. And, uh, and ultimately I think that, that where a lot of this open technology will end up is that uh, we'll see, especially with large organizations, more and more of those skills that used to be concentrated in software companies ending up in the, uh, the organizations of the large users. And we see that with Walmart, Comcast, again, AT&T, they have all hired up teams of, of OpenStack developers. You know, not just operators, but OpenStack developers because they see that this is strategic to their business over the long term. So, you know, again, I think you change how the technology gets developed over time, the consumption model and the, the business model around it changes quite a bit as well. And I would say we're probably halfway through that with, with OpenStack, you know, five and a half years in. And I think that, uh, that there's going to be, there's going to continue to be a lot of change and a lot of opportunity for people to, to, uh, to kind of find new ways to tie it into higher level services. Yeah. And just to add on to that, I think, I think Boris from uh, Marantis did give a keynote yesterday, made a really good point. It's like, I forget the number, he said, you know, nine tenths of cloud is operations or something like that. And the, the point is just, really important because we, we focus on the technology and the software and OpenStack is software, so that's what people want to talk about. But when you think about like how difficult it is to, you know, how much of a cloud is operations, you need to know how to operate it. So it, as, a, as a company that's looking to make money on it, you need to either help people in, by training them how to operate it, which is one of the things Marantis did early on, they're still doing, or you need to operate it for them. And so the, the, because the bits of software are you know, one tenth of the, of the challenge and the nine tenths is operations and that knowledge. If you think about the monetization and the opportunity to make money more on operation, operations, which is both a thing you, you offer as a service if it's hosted man, uh, managed, hosted private cloud or different models, or you're doing training and consulting to help people with the operations or being like level two, but it's not like you're, you're you know, tier two support when there's a bug. Yeah, you want that too, but it's mainly, hey, I'm having trouble operating. You know, cloud is, is a living thing, it's a bunch of services, it's effectively microservices is kind of where it's going with all the different OpenStack services. And that's part of where the, the Red Hat Linux analogy breaks down because it's just a different world. You yeah, know, yeah. To operate Linux on one machine, it wasn't really about operations. You installed it and you ran it. If there was a bug, you had a bug. But with the cloud, it's much more about this distributed system. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're Completely right. Uh, we often say, you know, cloud isn't a destination; it's an operations model. Mm -hmm. uh, at Wikibon, we actually put out a forecast that said, uh, kind of in, in, in the infrastructure space, I think it's about three hundred billion dollars worth of operational expense that's out there, and the transformation of cloud is going to take about half of that and either, you know, bake it into the platforms, you know, offload it to someone wow. else. It's not the old. Outsourcing of my mess for less, it's about transformational and really allowing me to focus on kind of my, my business, the application, and what's, what's I going I on I wish I heard there. that stat before I spoke today. <laughs> That's a really good stat. Yeah. <laughs> so, we're always looking for, for great data points like yeah. that. So I, I know we're going to wrap up. You guys are very, very busy this week. Uh, I, I want to I commend you on something. You know, uh, technology is a fantastic industry to work in. We get, I mean, we're, we're spoiled with a lot of things we get to do. There's some dark sides of technology. We've got some communities that sometimes are hostile. We've got some technology that happens where we fork things off. The OpenStack community has always been incredibly diverse, incredibly open to people, very, very welcoming. You never hear about sort of, you know, some of the really nasty things. And, and you guys should be really commended for that. I think what you've done is, is really important. Um, regardless of, of the technology, regardless of how much money, building that as a community, you guys should be incredibly proud of that. Thank you, I Thank appreciate you. that. We Thank take you. it really seriously, and I, I mean, that's, that's really special. <laughs> Thank you. Good. So, we, we talked to Heidi Joy yesterday about the user survey, so that's a great uh, metric of where the community is. Just, you know, since you're with the foundation, for those that didn't make it to the summit, uh, you know, share some of the, the key points, things that you guys are really excited about, and, you know, to echo what Brian said, you know, congratulations for such a small group, I mean, a Herculean effort to leverage <laughs> the community, uh, get things, I mean, you know, big party tonight for the first time, you know, yeah. we're put together uh, with the, the ecosystem and everything, so, uh, but what are the things that you'd really like to highlight for people? 
Well, you know, we, we've talked about, we've thrown out a lot of stats in the last couple of days of keynotes, 7,000, we're actually over 7,600 now, I think. Um, so we'll, our largest summit yet, um, huge diversity in terms of geographies that are, that are represented. And, uh, and, and that is one of the things that I love to see is, is how, like, like you said, you know, people coming in, new people coming in and, and participating. Um, the, the user survey this time around was, was, uh, was the biggest one that we have done, and we had, um, I think, 1,100 different organizations that responded. Uh, the thing that was probably really interesting that I don't know how, if, if she went into this or how much um, of this is in, in the report necessarily, but the, um, the, the user survey that we did six months ago and this user survey, there was only about 30% overlap. So there were only about 30% of people who filled out last time that took it again. And so that shows you know, how, how um, you know, it just continues to expand the, the pool of people. Um, but what was interesting was that there was a lot of consistency in the trends, and Mark pointed that out this morning. You know, a lot of other technologies being integrated into OpenStack. Um, there are a few key components that are in almost every cloud, Nova, Cinder, Glance, Keystone, um, and, and, the, uh, and so I think you know, it's, it's really cool to see how that core is, is maturing, people are adopting it, putting it in production, and then using that to expand and integrate with a lot of other things. All right, Jonathan Bryce, Mark Collier, with the OpenStack Foundation. Thank you again for helping to bring the cube here, and we'll be right back with more coverage here from OpenStack Summit 2016 in Austin. You're watching the cube. <laughs>